Hello, my name is Sean Copeland. I am Professor of Theology Emerita here at Boston College. I'm coming to you today on behalf of Sister Thea's kitchen. This isn't a literal kitchen, but to borrow a phrase from the late 50s and early 60s from the African-American cultural tradition, we could say that Sister Thea cooked in a seminar room much like this. And when I say cooked in this fashion, I mean that Sister Thea made her instruction satisfying, nourishing. It was good to be there and in her presence. Sister Thea Bowman was a scholar of the English language and English literature. She held a PhD from the Catholic University of America with a dissertation on Faulkner. So in tribute to her love for literature and mine, I want to begin this reflection with a quote from Zora Neale Hurston's Moses, Man of the Mountain. Here is Hurston. This freedom is a funny thing, Moses told the people. It ain't something permanent like rocks and hills. It's like manna. You just got to keep on gathering it fresh every day. If you don't, one day you're going to find you ain't got none no more. I'm getting kind of old, and I've been with you, like you say, back since Egypt. It's been tough sometimes. And maybe I neglected a lot of things I could have done off by myself. But if you just keep free and be a fine nation of folks, I'll feel like I bought something with my life. You done got free of Pharaoh and the Egyptian oppressors. Be careful you don't raise up none among yourselves. This passage from this particular book, which retells the story of Exodus in an African-American cultural idiom. This passage comes from this 1939 novel, Moses' Man of the Mountain, by Zora Neale Hurston. With freedom as its theme and the Exodus story retold, the novel condemned Germany's murderous racial aggression against the Jewish people. Germany's attack on Poland and its intensification of appeals to racial purity, selective reproduction, and extermination of all non-Aryans, and again, in particular, the Jewish people. In Moses' Man of the Mountain, Hurston has written a political allegory analogizing Hebrew oppression in biblical antiquity, black oppression in contemporary America, and Jewish oppression in Nazi Germany. Freedom and liberation from oppression with the assumption of human flourishing stand as the end or purpose of democracy. Yet, as that passage signified and history suggests, freedom is never unambiguous. Freedom. We think about freedom in the United States as the life breath of our existence. Freedom as political rights, rights to the franchise, rights to freedom of the exercise of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to assemble, to petition, to keep and bear arms, to be secure in one's person, freedom for due process. Freedom is the quality or state of being free. It's the absence of necessity, coercion or constraint in choice or in action. It's liberation from slavery or liberation from the power of another over one. Freedom, independence. Freedom. That was what the late Reverend C.T. Vivian and the late Congressional Representative John Lewis yearned, struggled, and sacrificed. 
freedom for which so many have sacrificed. Freedom, the word and its meanings, dance easily on the tongue. Yet the word and its, meaning, its meanings lose balance and stumble when confronted by bodies pushed to the outer margins and underside of freedom's embrace. In 1852, Frederick Douglass, fugitive slave, abolitionist, and patriot, asked with irony and righteous indignation, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? He goes on to answer, quote, a day that reveals more than all the other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which the slave is the constant victim. To the slave, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns and sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parades and solemnity are but mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy just a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a true nation." Close quote. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians, for freedom Christ has set us free. Freedom then is the great gift pouring out of the life and ministry, suffering and death and resurrection of the Jewish Jesus of Nazareth. This freedom, the gift of Christ, cuts across and through culture and religious practice, ethnicity and gender, social class and sexual orientation, economic standing and political affiliation. Jesus of Nazareth is the only measure and standard for our exercise of freedom in service of the reign of God. He is the clearest example of what it means to identify with children and women and men who are poor, excluded and despised. What it means to take their side in the struggle for life and freedom, no matter the cost. He is freedom incarnate, and his incarnation witnesses to a divine destiny for freedom seated in our very flesh. To borrow a phrase from Jose Sol's, we Christians all have damaged this gift damaged our freedom. The word and meanings of freedom rise from a dangerous memory, a phrase used by Johann Baptist Metz, the great German theologian. That dangerous memory rebukes our persistent bouts of national and cultural amnesia, our forgetfulness of the suffering and oppression of so many others, our indifference to the sacrifices of the dead, and the living. The memory of the passion and death of the crucified Jesus interrupts any unquestioning acceptance of the brutality of history, any smug approval of disingenuous political dispensations, and our not so benign neglect of one another, especially during these days of the coronavirus. The authentic meaning of freedom, religious, existential, social, eschatological, can be clarified only by grappling strenuously and humbly with our fearful memories of the concrete choices, decisions, and actions that have structured the world in which we live. Those memories should unseat us, insult our hearts, gnaw at our consciences. How can we follow Christ if we refuse to take in, reach out to those whom he sought out, whom he healed, whom he embraced? Worship separated from the great issues of liberty and justice has become an idolatry, an instrument of 
ideological manipulation, Duncan Forrester writes, a way of hiding from God rather than encountering God. That acknowledgement is the beginning of authentic freedom. Still, authentic exercise of freedom is not without risk. The deep demanding desire for freedom, for liberation, for emancipation is never in and of itself or in fact freedom, liberation, or emancipation. Moreover, the desire if substituted for actual liberation, can become a dangerous illusion that only aids the powers of oppression. Always, freedom intrinsically implies duty, obligation, and regard, rather than license and privilege. Authentic freedom roots itself in responsibility on personal, communal, and global levels. Freedom can never be only freedom from, but must be freedom for. Freedom for responsible and loving relationship with God. Freedom for just and compassionate relationships with others. Freedom for creative collaboration in constructing the common human good. Freedom expressed as solidarity mandates us to shoulder our responsibility to the past in the here and now in memory of the crucified Lord and all those forgotten and ignored victims of our past history. Such shouldering of responsibility obliges us in the here and now to stand between excluded, despised, and poor bodies and those powers of oppression in our society to do all that we can to stop their marginalization, exploitation, abuse, and murder. In memory of the cross of Jesus, we must accept this obligation, even if it means we must endure rejection or loss. This shouldering of responsibility summons us to the work of justice in the concrete and recognizes particular tasks for each of us by virtue of our differing social locations. Yet this praxis of freedom always requires us to be on guard against any form of self-deceit or self-delusion, against any time to deny our call to solidarity or to act as if, though, as if the world were devoid of the poor and suffering. As disciples of the crucified Jesus, we exercise our gift of freedom in the here and now, and we do so as we yearn for and work for the eschatological healing and building up of the body of Christ, that is, the whole of humanity. <laughs>